So good afternoon and good evening, everybody. I'm Vida Ng, Executive Director of the Canadian Unitarian Council. Welcome to our continuing series of inclusivity forums where we are practicing living into our eighth principle. And for those of you who have attended our forums before, we know that what you know that one of the things that we do is actually shake things up a little bit um, and make us all feel a little bit uncomfortable. And that is actually our intention. We want to help us all lean into the discomfort and just kind of stay there for however long it takes. So the material that we've gathered for this inclusivity forum has been shared with us by very generous UUs. And they've made that decision to be generous and in doing so have also made themselves vulnerable. So we thank them for that. And we also, I also ask that we take our cues about any conversation on what they have shared with us and that we hold their sharing in confidence. Um, and Amber has mentioned, if you need any kind of tech support, just message me directly rather than putting a chat into the general conversation. Uh, we're going to get going, and I'd like to welcome our guests, Alex Capitan and Teo Drake. Amber and Erin will give you a little bit more information about them. Thank you. Yeah, so welcome. I'll give you kind of a quick overview of what to expect for this evening, which um, I'm quite excited about to be be honest, to have Teo and Alex with us is a pretty amazing treat. Um, so what we will do is we'll start as always with our responsibility covenant and a blessing from Shauna, who is holding the spiritual container for our time together. Then we will um, invite Alex and Teo to lead us in a reflection um, to start, right, to try to understand how we are impacted by gender-based um, oppression. And then we will move into uh, what I think will be a, a very riveting conversation about how this is showing up in our communities. One of the, the neat things about Alex and Teo is the lived experience within the UU communities. So um, not just talking about gender-based oppression, but lived experience within the UU world. So the UU sphere, <laughs> as it were. So um, we'll be starting with that, and then we will go into our, our discussion question. Uh, which will be in the caucus groups. And then at the top of the hour, we will have a break for 10 minutes. Then we will come back to our second discussion group, which will be a mixed discussion group because we'll be wanting to look at how we might move forward, right? So the first discussion group, we're looking at how is this showing up in our communities? And the second one, we're saying, okay, now what are we gonna do about this? How do we wanna move forward? So we'll have our second discussion group and then come back for a Q&A with Alex and Teo towards the end. So get your questions ready, have them ready to go into the chat. There is no such thing as a silly question or, uh, I mean, even if you ask it with a good heart, there's no such thing as a rude question, right? Because we are actually trying to learn. So be prepared for that. And then Shauna will close up at the very end um, for us. So two hours, which I think we're gonna go by quite quickly, but will be, um, I think, quite uh, enlightening for all of us. So. Yeah, Amber, do you want to tell us a little bit more of the caucus group details for those of us who missed it on the way in? Yeah, I'm going to plug this into the chat so you can follow along with me. Um, we are doing things a little bit differently tonight. And so our caucus groups, um, we're going to have three versions of these caucus groups. And so we want you to just assign yourself by re and renaming. Um, and that way you can self-select. Self um, so we ask that um, for the first conversation to rename yourself now so Vita can get set up to put you in those rooms, uh, that you put in brackets first, M, W, or T, then your name, then your community. Uh, that could be if you're a young adult or, or if your congregation or if you're somehow, somehow you are connected to the you know, Unitarian Universalism. And then your pronouns in brackets. You do not have to put your pronouns. We, um, if you want to tell Vita where you'd prefer to be, then that is perfectly fine. Uh, we don't want to pressure anyone into doing anything. Um, and MWT, I'm just going to read off what that means so that you can hear yourself in one of these groups and then you can write that down. 
So the first group is M, and that means all cis men. Also, it's open to trans men and non-binary people to talk about how patriarchy affects us and lives through us. And then the second group, which would be defined with this W, is for all cis women. And that is also open to trans women and non-binary people to talk about their experiences of sexism and misogyny. And the third caucus will be for trans and non-binary folks marked with a T to talk about experiences of transphobia, sexism, patriarchy, etc. And again, trans and non-binary people are welcome to pick a caucus based on your own life experiences and what you'd prefer to talk about in your small group. And again, you don't have to make it known in the in your name, but you can also just let Vita know who's tech tonight. And also, if you need captioning, just add a backslash before your name as well. Thank you for all of that. If anyone needs help, just uh, text Amber or Vita and they'll give you a hand. Yes. I am going to light our multi-wit chalice as a reminder that of our aspiration to become a truly inclusive community and hopes that the work that we're doing at forums like tonight will, um, yeah, will result in that true inclusivity so that you'll see many different flames here. And I'd like to invite Shauna to come to the spotlight to, uh, to open our gathering with a blessing. Thank you, Erin and Amber and Vita. It is lovely to see all of you uh, this evening. And as Vita opened us up by saying that we might be stepping into some discomfort this evening, I think it's appropriate to start our spiritual time with a little bit of a somatic exercise. So because this is embodied work, it's not work that we do just with our heads, it's uh, work that we do with our whole selves. So I invite you, uh, if you feel comfortable doing so, to put, uh, put your hands on your, on your heart or on your chest area and to breathe a few times deeply because that's where your vulnerability is. That's where you feel the opening to new things, to new people, to new learnings. And throughout our lives, throughout this journey of existence, we are always presented with opportunities to learn new things, to listen deeply to the stories, to the lives, to the experiences of others. And when we do so, we're invited to deepen our understanding. And so let's breathe this evening into that new kind of opening to that learning and that understanding that comes from that deep place within us that knows that there is always more to understand about ourselves and then by extension others in this world in order to make it a more loving more hospitable, more gracious, more inclusive place for us all. So may it be so as we gather this evening. Blessed be. Thank you, Shauna. Well, as you know, we love our covenants us Unitarian Universalists, and we are going to just start with a reminder of the ones that we have um, in our materials and the ones that we've been working with quite a bit since we've been starting this process together. The first one is our community covenant, and that's really, as you've read it before, it's just to remind us how we want to be in relationship with one another. And you know, in these groups, especially, we want to pay attention to the responsibility covenant, which reminds us when we're in relative privilege of how sometimes our discomfort can be harmful to others. So we're here to really manage our own personal discomfort. So we really want to look at this resist column and allow this, um, these ways that sometimes we resist um, so or these ways that we deal with our personal discomfort uh, to give us a little bit of data for how we're managing ourselves in these moments. So 
if you feel yourself uh, about to debate or analyze or censor or criticize, if you're projecting or being dismissive, you're minimizing, moralizing, silencing, or maybe even acting in a performative way, these sometimes are ways that we manage our personal discomfort and just check on those and see if, if that's what, what's up. And um, so that we can make sure that the people in the room all feel safe and don't have to deal with us as we move through this process. Erin? Mm -hmm. um, so what should we do then? Well, let's let's uh, end the screen sharing here. And if, um, if our tech can help spotlight both Amber and I, please. Mm -hmm. um, so what should we do then if someone in our group does not follow the responsibility covenant? We get asked this a lot. So let's just answer it right up front, right? So um, keep in mind, right, that sometimes that projecting that we do, it's it's hard not to do it. Sometimes we don't even notice that we're doing it. So um, we use our hand as sort of a signal to help people to remember that, you know, they're projecting outwards and how about turning it inwards? Mm -hmm. So ways that you can help people to do that is just by asking them a question that directs it back to them. So how does that feel then inside you when that's going on? or you know something like that, right? That helps them to steer the ship back inward. Um, if they're being quite rude or belligerent um, or you know, outward attacking, at that, and that does happen sometimes when we get so agitated that we've lost track of our own comfort level, right? We're doing things that are just meant to try to stop the threat that we feel inside ourselves, right? So in which case you might say, it feels like you're projecting into our space when we're asking to try to look inward. Uh, and then, you know, there's, we can help with that, right? That's one thing you can offer. Or if they still are really, really not doing well with <laughs> the redirect, then you can also say, hey, you can go back to the main room where they'll find Vita and, and Vita can then help them work it through. Let's not use this as a shaming thing because sometimes the best learning comes from someone taking that time to help us figure out what happens when we can feel less threatened so that we don't have to say stop stop doing the thing whatever that is and can you know stop and look look inward so let's if we can try to approach it like that with each other um, one other thing that we have um, noticed um, we want to be careful to to remember that we are not entitled to anybody's stories okay so people have chosen to share with us um, what they've chosen to share on these videos. That doesn't mean that they've given uh, permission for us to solicit their input outside of this time. It doesn't mean that every time that we meet in person or online, that that's the thing that we are to be talking about. The understanding is that this is a gift that we've been given. We are to receive it with thanks. If one of the people on the videos happens to be in your group or is your facilitator, that's not the time to be asking them to explain more details about their life experience because it's a gift, right? It's not, not there to be analyzed or critiqued. I see nods and that's, that's very comforting to, to see. All right, um, if we can get some spotlights on Alex and Teo, then uh, we will get started with that portion of the evening. And we want to thank you both for, for being here. Yay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, I'm Teo. And you want to just introduce yourself a little yep. bit? Yep. We, so we uh, my, name is, <laughs> my name is Alex Capitan. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, my pronouns are Z and per, which is short for person, or he and him, or Alex, Alex, Alex. And I'm Teo. Alex and I are partners. We're both um, actually US-based, although I keep trying to sneak over the border and hoping the US never lets me back in. Um, and so my pronouns are he, him, and his, and um, I'm just really grateful to be here. So yeah. All right. So we want to start off the sort of diving into it part. Now that we've gotten settled into this space, we're all here. Um, we want to take a moment to actually give folks a chance to reflect inward for a few minutes. And this is going to be a reflection that's just for you, 
You're not gonna have to share it later, put it on a bulletin board. It's just to get you grounded in the topic that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. So do you wanna share that reflection question? Absolutely. And um, I think the one thing I, I wanna say before we get started, mm -hmm. because we are actually asking you to, to, to look at some stuff that as has already been said, may be hard to look at. And it may be hard to look at because it's just traumatic and painful. And, and for those of us that that is true, um, try not to dive off the deep end of the pool, right? Like th this doesn't require you to be in overwhelm. So like, don't take on the hardest things you can possibly think of. And for those of us that maybe some of the things that we're looking at actually come actually from the advantages that we had and and we might be a little embarrassed or feel shame around those, um, the same thing, like just, just kind of come in and, and be, uh, no one's gonna see this, right? But one thing I think that's really important, I know that Alex, I can speak for both of us, is that neither of us ever take for granted um, the, the trust that you put in us to do this work, right? And so one is I, I want you to hear very clearly that we're grateful that you're here and honor the fact that just showing up says a lot about um, the willingness to kind of hold this work. And, and it's the work is hard no matter where we come from and for different reasons. And so don't want anyone to feel that that we aren't actually just honoring your heart and your courage to do this work. And so just know that we're holding that while we ask you to grapple with some of this stuff. So what we're going to ask you to do is um, to really reflect on however you do that, whether that is actually in writing, drawing, thinking, whatever that is, um, how have the cultural messages about gender impacted you, either negatively or positively, right, depending on, on where our location is. And that might be thinking about things that you felt pressured to be more masculine or feminine or times that you faced um, consequences for actually crossing a line, a hard line in the sand in a ways that someone of your gender or perceived gender should not, right? And there's also for, should not. <laughs> and, and and again, for some of us, actually, you know, the, the cultural messages, um, particularly it, when we align with them, we get actual praise for those. And how has that impacted us, right? And sometimes, you know, in this work, it can be a little harder to want to own up to that stuff. So we can be coming from a mix of that for most of us. But even for those of us for whom um, we get a lot of praise for that, there, there's still a cost. And sometimes that cost isn't evident to us as quickly, but be willing to have heart and take a look at that. So how long do folks have? Three minutes. Does that sound like a good amount of time? Right. So just take three minutes to... You might want to journal, you might want to write, you might want to poke at a device, you might want to just sit there and think and contemplate how have cultural messages about gender impacted you either negatively or positively. And again, no need to dive off the deep end, but just give that some thought for a few minutes.
Take another 20 or 30 seconds to finish your reflections for now. All right. All right. So I um, just want to pause. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for Jenna for your introduction about that, that this is heart work. This is somatic work. It's body-based work, right? That this isn't, um, none of us can reason our way out of this system that's impacted us in various ways, right? So we've asked you a question that that may have landed for you in, in, in ways that are hard, right? Um, and so I just want you to take a moment to just hold that and look about like what's what's the tenderness in your heart where's your heart right now right where are you holding what you've just been reflecting on in your body right particularly for me i have to look at my shoulders my jaw right and just release whatever and wherever you've held it if you feel that you can right the thing that's important to know is that um when we touch those tender parts, particularly that as we talk about for folks, those of us who have discomfort around acknowledging um, the ways in which we've been we've had advantages, right? That that really touching on that, the ways that it actually um, often, for, at least for me, it tugs at my heart. That becomes my stake in the game, right? Like that tug can either be discomfort that I run away from, or it's the thing I hold on to that keeps calling me forward every single time I wanna run away, right? And so really hold on to what that tug is for you, um, particularly for those of us who have the option to turn away or to look away um, and find that, find that tug right now, right? And, and hold on to that, particularly when things might get a little bit uncomfortable, a little uncertain, right? And for those of us for whom that, that you know, it's it's discomfort out of an actual place of pain. Um, at least for me, I know that when I'm in shared space, the fact that I know I'm not alone and that um, I can look around and know that we are all together in this um, is also something that helps me keep coming back to this work, regardless of depending on how I'm coming to it. So just take a moment. Let's take a moment to breathe together. Just understand that your heart space is touching other people's heart spaces, regardless of how distant we are logistically. Thanks. And also how distant we might be in other ways, in terms of age, in terms of race, in terms of geography. You know, the truth is this system that we all have been burdened with and born into and forced to live through this system of patriarchy and misogyny and sexism is something that affects everyone and negatively impacts everyone even though it creates conditions that are meant to you know privilege and uh so you know lift up certain people at the expense of others the truth is all of us are harmed to varying degrees very varying degrees <laughs> but still it's important to be in touch with the ways in which you have been negatively impacted by this uh system and to know that that experience is something that connects literally all of human humanity right we have to find a way to get free not just because some of us aren't going to survive otherwise but because all of us are hurt and limited when we aren't allowed full access to the fullness of who we are called to be when it comes to gender and how we are called to live when it comes to gendered gendered ways of being so we don't want to talk too much because we want to really give you a lot of time to be able to talk to each other and reflect in small groups i'm just checking to see what time we're supposed to go into that great so we have a little bit of time to just share a little bit some gems, some thoughts with you, lay some things on you to frame the conversation. Um, I wanted to start by just sharing a little bit about 
um, the experience that I've had within Unitarian Universalism because of the fact that I've been a UU for more than 30 years now. I'm actually 38, so 32 years since my parents joined a UU church when I was six. And one of the things that is true is that growing up a Unitarian Universalist was an enormous blessing for me as a young queer and trans kid who didn't have the language to name those things about myself for a good long time. You know, it's not easy being a teenager, no matter who you are, and being a UU and having UU youth community in particular was literally saving for me. Um, so I'm so grateful to Unitarian Universalism for the gift of never experiencing religious violence as a queer and trans person. There aren't that many people in my life who can say that, that they've never experienced religious violence, particularly because of the work that we do, which is faith-based LGBTQ work. Um, and yet, as I grew into adulthood, it became clear to me that the church that I was raised to, uh, the faith that I was raised to, to practice and to, to believe in wasn't actually reflected in the adult church that I was expected to bridge into um, when I grew up. And so I have actually never found a UU congregation where I felt like I could get my spiritual needs met. And it's not just because I'm trans and queer, right? It's because my cultural experience of Unitarian Universalist as somebody who is queer and trans, but also raised UU, someone who's a certain age, someone who has certain chosen family and, and friends, isn't the culture of the average adult UU church. And so what we've, what so many of us have experienced is this incredible culture clash that exists and all of these interesting dynamics that are going on <laughs> between the experiences that people are having, um, the various different experiences that people are having in UU congregations relative to all sorts of aspects of their social location. Um, so one of the things that is true is that, uh, and one of the things that's so frustrating, I think, for people like me, and certainly for me, is the fact that the story that we tell about ourselves as Unitarian Universalists is that we've checked this box, right? We did the welcoming congregation program, whatever year we did it. Usually it was, the average was circa 2003, right? And we checked the box. We took care of that. We should have cracked this nut. At a certain point in time, our congregations were ordaining something like 6% of all of our ministers were women. And within a decade or two of putting really concerted effort into that situation, the majority of our uh, ministers who were being ordained were women. And we thought, check, we solved it. We beat sexism, right? And the truth is, I think it's all of a piece, right? The, and the piece is when we believe that this is something that can be checked off and moved on from, right? Whether it's employment opportunities for women, <laughs> whether it's actually creating a religious home where LGBTQ people can find themselves and feel, feel a sense of belonging in, there's this sense that if we just take one step and check that box, that we don't have to continually keep asking ourselves these questions about, okay, how else, how else are we perpetuating oppression without even realizing it? when it comes to the gender norms that we have internalized, when it comes to the expectations that we have around how our minister will act, right? What our minister will wear, who will take care of the kids on Sunday mornings in RE, like what genders are involved in these tasks and these labors in different congregations. And also when it comes to the experiences of trans and non-binary folks in our congregations, what we're seeing is there was a point in time where the expectations that trans and non-binary people had were so low that it was literally like, oh, 
a church that isn't telling me that I'm going to hell. All right. That's amazing. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. And these days, as somebody who has raised you, you with no religious trauma, I get to have higher expectations for my religious community than simply not being told I'm going to hell, right? So that was an important <laughs> milestone because there was a point in time where we realized as a movement that our congregations were perpetuating homophobia and transphobia um, in some pretty serious ways without realizing it. And we realized that's not, a, that's not who we are. That's not who we want to be. And unfortunately, we sort of did a little bit of the bare minimum in some cases and then didn't continue to learn and grow from the folks among us who were saying, I expect more from this religious community, right? And we've lost a lot of people because of that. Um, a lot of the folks here perhaps um, are like me and can't find an actual brick and mortar congregation because of the fact that those congregations haven't lived up to our expectations around this, this topic. So I'm gonna stop there. I could get into like stats and things, but I just don't feel like we need to. We can talk about them later. We can talk about them later if we need to. What else would you say? Or what else do you think? Some of the stats come from a survey that folks should Yeah, like. that's true. And it's on the resource list. Yep. So. So, yeah. Um, I think just so, so we have some shared common language mm -hmm. um, and language is a tricky thing because it is it moves faster than I can often articulate it. Um, so know that just sort of this is what we're going to work with tonight and, you know, meetings change. But for some really simple stuff, when we're talking about patriarchy, misogyny and sexism, right? Um, it's kind of a ways to think about how they're interrelated is that sexism is the ideology that one gender has more value than another, right? The and gender is binary. The gender's a the gender's binary, but that but that that you could actually have a, one of more value, right? There's the hierarchy, mm -hmm. and that's the ideology of that. Patriarchy is the social order that it, the ways that a society orders itself to live out its ideology, right? So the fact that there is an ideology that any one gender is more valuable than another, and in this case, manhood and men, right? That that's more valuable than the social order is going to be something that creates that in a lived way, right? So that's what patriarchy is. Misogyny is actually the best way to think about misogyny is as the, the, the law enforcement of that ideology and that social order. So mis misogyny shows up when anyone is perceived, any one person or a group is perceived to be violating the ideology and rocking the boat of the social order, right? So misogyny often is thought of as like folks who hate women, right? Or internalized hatred, right? But it's not, it's, it's, it's about transgression and a social order that needs to be maintained at all costs. And because misogyny is that, right? There's a way in which that is also then related to other social orders, right? You can't talk about, about sexism. You can't talk about womanhood, right? Without having some lens on race, right? You can't talk about gender in any way without having some lens on class. And in order to be able to wrangle with this stuff, sometimes it's important to narrow our focus a little bit, but understand that we can't have silos, right? That we can't talk about womanhood as if it's monolithic, right? That black womanhood is going to be different inherently than white womanhood in some very important ways to acknowledge and not erase, right? At the same time, talking about gender-based oppression, there needs to be some common conversation while holding all of that nuance, right? And so we're not, we don't want to actually um, narrow the focus so much that we're not acknowledging those things. My manhood and the ways that I live that out is very class based, right? And it, it comes out of the class I came from. Um, and so it does differ from men who, in trans or cis, who, who raise a different class, right? And, and so it's important to kind of hold those nuances. And that's often where, um, when we paint this broad brush, that we, we lose people or actually in many ways erase people. And we don't want to do that. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So that's that it. might be enough for now. Let's send people into groups. Because <laughs> we want to give you a chance to, to, to chew on this a little bit. Mm -hmm. and think about this and talk about it together. And we wanna give you plenty of time to do that. And there'll be more time for conversation later. Mm -hmm. So um, 
let's do that. Let's go into our first breakout group. If you're ready, Vita, do we want to give people one more uh, reminder of the whole naming convention thing? Or are you good? Yeah, Amber and I can uh, can jump in here and help with that. Right. Okay. Bye. Cool. Yeah, I um, just want to uh, um, introduce our facilitators for tonight. We have, uh, there's, aside from Aaron and I, I think there's about 14 facilitators who have been working with us um, almost since the beginning, some of us, some, some since the beginning. And just to mention that uh, most of, most of our facilitators tonight are young adults. And we're very excited about that. Um, just wanted to lift that up. Uh, in terms of naming and renaming yourself, uh, I'm going to put this in the chat again, just so that we all are on the same page. If you could rename yourself with the caucus group that you uh, fit into or would like like to like to go into, uh, you'll in brackets you'll put either an M, a W, or a T, then your name, then the community that you're with, and your pronouns if you would like. If someone's not uh, acknowledging their pronouns, you can always just refer to them by their name, and that's a nice way of of welcoming everyone. So if you are in the M group, uh, you are a cis man. You could be open, it, the, the group is open to trans men and non-binary people to talk about how patriarchy affects you and lives through you. If you're a W, then you would be a cis woman and you could also be a trans woman, non-binary person, and you'd be talking about experiences of sexism and misogyny. And the third group with a T uh, are for uh, specifically trans and non-binary folks to talk about experiences of transphobia, sexism, patriarchy, etc. So if you're trans or non-binary, you're welcome to pick a caucus of your choice based on your life experience and what you'd prefer to talk about in your small group. And again, you don't have to name your pronouns or one of the groups, you can write to Vita right now and let her know she's tech um, where you would prefer to be. Also, if you need captioning, please put a backslash before your name. And our discussion yeah. question, which uh, will show up in the chat, it's how have you observed or experienced gender dynamics playing out in your UU community? And just a reminder that we want to be thinking, you know, how are we co-creating this environment? Not looking at it like someone else has done this thing because we bring with us the cultural values that we have taken on as our own and we recreate those. So um, I'm doing this with my hand for those of you who are new. We use this as a way to remind ourselves when we are projecting outwards as opposed to looking inwards. So in this particular question, we do want to observe but let's observe it like we are a group, right? Nobody is doing a thing to us. We are co-creating it together. Um, two minutes each person, do elect a timekeeper, um, and then you know give a 30 second warning when the time is about to go up. Um, please try to use feeling words. Those connect us as opposed to judgy words, which tend to create that, uh, that reaction within us, right? So. Uh, let's do that. And then the last thing is we have created a Padlet. Our facilitators know about this. You do not have to use it if technology stresses you out, but it is a way for us to all see what we are creating. So uh, that will show up in the, the chat. And facilitators, make sure you have it open and just elect one person to keep track of what you talk about. Um, the Padlet allows you to write a comment and you can see other people's comments. So you don't have to write the same thing. You can just press that you like it or add a, another comment under theirs. Hopefully that makes sense. Enjoy your, how oh, little it looks like we'll be about till eight o'clock that we'll have eight o'clock my time, <laughs> top of the hour, wherever you are. <laughs> all righty. We all back, checking to see the screens. People are popping back up again, it's a good sign. All right, can we get Amber and I up on the screen now? Is 
All right, Amber somewhere. There she is. <laughs> Looking good, Erin. Hey, Amber. <laughs> Do you want to read off the question first and then I can just remind people about moving in or would you like me to talk about these mixed groups? Certainly, I can read off the, the question and then yeah. the talking. So um, our second question, um, and, and by the way, some of you asked, will we do some discussion? I checked with Teo and Alex, and what we're going to do is our second discussion question, then we're going to come back, and then that's going to be like the time we make it all make sense. <laughs> so that's when we'll do some storytelling, talking, sharing, these sort of things, and then questions for them. Um, so the second discussion question is, thinking about your UU community, what are a some small steps that could be taken right now to remove barriers to full inclusion and b some big dreams that are worth working towards? And once again, please elect a timekeeper, two minutes each person's just to share the time. Um, and we will have a Padlet and we'll get that one into the chat right now. I'll do that while you talk, Amber. Yeah, and just to remind us that this is our opportunity to really practice our responsibility covenant um, and because we will be in mixed groups, so we will be in the presence of people who feel very excluded and who, who have struggled and felt harm toward them. Uh, so if you do feel unsafe, if you're one of those people, you can mention it to your facilitator or just go um, leave your, your breakout room and return to the main room. And um, just, you know, we're working on this together. So pay attention to your personal discomfort and use that information to guide you toward transformation. Can we do 15 minutes on this one, Vita? One of the small steps that uh, Ilara noticed I'll mention was get curious, mm. which I thought was, just really like, you know, on point, very simple way to, to move in a direction. Yeah, and I see on here, and maybe we can ask Alex and, and Teo about this, but so we have some that are really specific and you can tell that they're specifically related to gender inclusion. And then you see ones that are a little bit broader, like adopt the eighth principle or engage millennials or um, younger people. So it'd be interesting then to hear your perspectives at some point about, you know, how how do we, you know, like sometimes find, like narrow in our focus on something and other times, you know, be a little bit more broad. Um, what we'll do right now is we're, we're going to just open the floor for some questions and Teo and Alex, you can bring up or ask us to bring up these um, Padlets to if you want, we can look at them more. Um, but folks, what we will do is open the, the chat right now for Q&A. Amber and I will alternate and watch the questions that you put up and try to bring them up for Alex and Teo to answer. Um, as people work on that, Alex uh, and, and Teo to, to the degree that it's relevant, um, can you speak to us a little bit about your experiences in UU spaces? and what you think is needed in order for people of all genders to be able to show up fully. So there's a lot on these pad padlets that, I mean, are awesome, but you know, where do we begin? Because it's such a huge thing, right? The, the thing that I feel like keeps coming up again and again and again in conversations about radical welcome and belonging, whether it's about gender or whether it's really about any any aspect of who we are. And it came up in our conversations as we were even preparing for this session tonight, um, is the need for us as communities and as individuals to really embrace as a spiritual practice, the ability to engage in conflict in ways that are spiritually grounded. Because so much of what is pushing out all sorts of people, <laughs> whether it's we're burning out women who are doing most of the work on committees and then not being respected by uh, just a couple, a handful of men who are taking the power away, right? Whether it's, you know, ministers, who are who are whose ministries are ending in negotiated resignations simply because they aren't ministering in the way that people expect them to based on the fact that the congregations only ever had 
straight cis white men as ministers before, whether it's trans kids who share who they are and then don't have that respected by their congregations. What, what could keep those things from happening is if everyone in the congregation took responsibility for upholding the congregation's covenant around how are we together? What is acceptable? Who are we trying to be? And when Bob, I'm sorry, it's always Bob, whenever I imagine some imaginary person, I'm sorry if anyone here is named Bob, when Bob for the umpteenth million time doesn't respect the minister who's a woman or tries to undermine the board president who's a woman or misgenders someone or, or makes some off color remark about trans women, and some, the other person standing there, all the people standing there go, Bob, no, that's not who we are. We're not gonna do that here. And we love you. We want you to continue to be part of this, this community, but we need something different from you. And we need to take collective responsibility for that. Because right now there's a whole lot of, mm, it's uncomfortable to be in conflict. I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. He makes a lot of pledges. We need him on the buildings and grounds committee. No, we need to be braver than that because what's happening is every time someone doesn't push back when something like that happens, 20 people say, oh, I guess this isn't a space where I can actually be. And they leave and they don't come back. So that's the number one thing for me that I feel like our, our congregations really need. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think part of it, again, I think, and you said this, is sort of um, is, is leaving behind the checklists and the to-do lists and the, the sense of mastery and, and genuinely thinking about this as a spiritual practice and, and what's the spiritual work that, given where, wherever any of us are coming from, like what is the spiritual work we need to do? And like that keeps us in our hearts, keeps us in our bodies and um, and dares us, dares us to be willing to fail together, right? Because if, if there's a faith-based grounding, right? Failure just be, becomes sort of a place that faith can, can bring us back from, right? But if there's not, if there's not a way of thinking about this, if, it, if we're thinking about this as mastery and failure, it's too fragile. It's too fragile for anyone, like particularly any culture to take on. So mm -hmm. I think it's about like, what is it about the UU faith that that actually is exactly the tools to then do this work that stays heart-centered, right? Absolutely. Hmm. That just reminds me that I won't speak for another five minutes. I just have one more thing <laughs> of that. that. And, but this is, this is a part of the like, been there, done that temptation, right? Is to be like, can we, put more value in our practice of being Unitarian Universalist than in our identity of being good people, right? Who already have this figured out. That's not going to serve us. Interesting. Yeah, that vulnerability, that gentleness is so key. Okay, I've got some questions here. Two of them, there's two that are kind of like bookends a little bit. I'm going to read them together but answer them how you want. Um, so how can we create a more welcoming space for older trans folks who need a place to heal? But th there was another question before that that was talking about um, four of the 20 youth ages 10 to 13 who came to OWL identified as trans. How can we offer them a more welcoming space? So, so we're, we're, we're digging into these two different cultures. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to create welcoming spaces that are, that? Um, bridge that gap. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's hear it. I mean, so I have long felt that the fact that Unitarian Universalist communities are multi-generational communities is one of our strongest strengths as a religion, because there are fewer and fewer places in our world in this increasingly divided social media driven bubble specific world where we really do get the chance to be in deep relationship across lines of generation. And young trans people desperately need to be in relationship with elders. There aren't enough elders. We haven't had enough elders survive 
right? But we definitely need that. And elders desperately need to be in relationship, deep loving relationship with kids and youth because it is healing to have that kind of relationship in your life. So our congregations can absolutely be those places where folks of all different genders can be in deep relationship across all different generations and where young people can learn about what older lesbians had to go through and, you know, what uh, young bisexual folks are experiencing that's completely different from whatever, right? But in order to do that, we actually have to value all of those generations equally. And I think that's one of the things that we are struggling with right now as a movement is saying, hey, there is a unique experience of Unitarian Universalism that is happening in our youth groups, in OWL, in the younger folks. And it's not, it's not lesser than what's happening in the adult congregation, but to a certain, to a large degree, folks in the adult half of the congregation don't even realize that the young folks are actually living and practicing a unique flavor of Unitarian Universalism that is practically incompatible with what happens on Sunday morning. That may be truer to the actual lived faith. Yeah. Right. Okay. So if we can't actually start to, to, to explore your flavor of Unitarian Universalism and my flavor of Unitarian Universalism and you know all the different flavors that everyone is bringing with curiosity and openness, instead of saying church can only happen in this one way, in this one flavor, that's to me the way in which we can actually start to build those multi-generational spaces. Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, I think that I do a lot of trauma work and I particularly do a lot of trauma work with trans folks actually. And um, the antidote to fight, flight and freeze, right? Is actually tend and befriend. It's it, the absolute antidote. The thing that heals trauma is, is and it has to be, they have to occur like, you can't have one or the other, right? That we have to feel like we are capable of meeting the needs of others, right? That 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 people need us. Simultaneously, we also need to feel like there are people that we can go to who will hold us. If if those are out of balance or only one exists and the other does not, trauma can't heal, right? And I think particularly when we're talking about populations where um, there's a lot of trauma, but it's different, right? That that there needs to be some tending to that in a ways that, so we can speak, you know, Alex and I are, are um, of different generations age-wise and also experience-wise, right? And, and we, you know, and I've talked about this before was that um, as somebody who is binary identified, I live in the world as a man, right? That, that my path to get here was a nightmare. Right, the amount of physical violence I faced, the amount of emotional violence I faced, the amount of spiritual violence I faced it was horrendous. Right, and so I carry an immense amount of trauma by that. And so when I sometimes what, earlier when I would meet young folks who would be like, "Gender doesn't exist," right? <laughs> and if, if you want to be a man, it's wrong. And I'd be like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! I almost died for this." Right, like, hello. <laughs> and and so intergenerationally, sometimes there was a way of us we weren't even like we weren't even speaking the same language. Right, right? and so it would be easy for me to be resentful of him because he didn't suffer the way that I did, right? And for him to have a story that I didn't want him to exist because, you know, like he he didn't hold to a gender binary. It was all methodical. I'm not embodying trans and in the same way knows, or the right way. Who knows what that story is? <laughs> but some of it was actually that he needed to actually hear my story and understand that that, that was real, right? Like that, that lives in my body and it always will, right? And at the same time, right, I had to make room for the fact that thank fucking God that he didn't have to live through that, right? Like I fought with my body on the line so he didn't have to, right? But those have to be, there has to be an intergenerational conversation that can be held with an eye on trauma, right? And in a way of for that we can hear one another's stories where none of those are, are better than the other, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and it, that's true across generations along all kinds of differences, exactly. right? And and the more that we understand that, 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 that at the core of everything is belonging, right? Who belongs? And when elders feel like they can belong, right? And we know this, like when elders get invited to, to tell story, right? To, to story time, to read stories, right? There's there's something that changes, right? And, and a big part of that is that no one is disposable. And often who feels most disposable are elders and the very young. Yes. And that's where the focus needs to be on that none of us are disposable. And we just need to really have our hearts on the line to hear one another. Yes. Is a big part of that. And share of ourselves deeply. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
we have like I think four more really, really great questions here. Let's see if we can rapid fire them at you. And see we'll try to be succinct. It's really not our strong suit. Oh, I love it. It's so amazing to listen to you. Um, um, okay, here. How do I break the binary in my brain? My heart expands to welcome all kinds of genders, but my brain defaults to two categories of people. Yes. You want to talk to that because of yeah. new neural pathways? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing, right? Around neuroplasticity, the, the thing that we fight with is the thing is the path that we grow, right? So if we think about the fact that I need to be at war with this thing I was taught is actually the thing that keeps that pathway traveled, right? And you can't make that go away. It can only atrophy, right? So part of that is actually turning towards, right? It's 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 not that that there's anything shameful. That's what I was told. That's what I was taught, right? And so it's it's finding creative ways to actually turn your attention. So every single time your attention goes here, find something to turn it towards, right? Mm -hmm. Read the stories of people who, whose experiences are different. Um, listen to like, go watch documentaries like um, Disclosure. Disclosure. Right? Just take in things that aren't an effort to like be at war with something, but but are from a place of curiosity. And the more that that grows, literally the more that that neural pathway in our brains changes. Yeah. Just take a different road. And, the, you know, and, and so how could we not? How could we not think in binaries? Like, how could we not? And and we don't have to stay there. It, but it's simply, it's it's there's no shame. It's just look away and look somewhere else, and that will actually be the change. Every time you shame yourself, it makes it worse, yeah. right? Yeah. It just locks you into that same neural pathway. Yeah. So whenever you notice, and that's part of the the thing is just you notice, oh, I'm making an assumption right now. I wonder what could be different instead? What if, right? And that's that's all you can do is just build a new road. Mm, I love that with the curiosity. Mm -hmm. That I think is one of the suggestions in the, the Padlets, right? With curiosity, there's more doors that open and then yeah, that neuroplasticity shift can happen. Very cool. Amber, you see a question there? Yeah, this is from Yvette. Uh, how do I respond to peers or colleagues who refer to gender exploration and identification as a fad? How do I respond when a superior, a, posi a position or older person does the same? Yeah, this is really important. And it's not just the fad thing. It's like all of the talking points that are out there right now, particularly we live in the United States and it is a mess right now because of the way in which the conservative right has just latched onto uh, trans folk as the next wedge issue. They don't think they don't see us as real human beings or, or at all real in any way. Okay. They are seeing us as a way of, of driving their base to the polls. And so it's it is ugly. So there's a lot of really ugly rhetoric out there right now. And some of it is is less ugly than others, like the idea that this is a fad. It's not overtly violent, but it is violent, you know, to like sort of diminish people by being like, well, all of a sudden there's non-binary people everywhere. This is clearly just a fad. No, what's happening is people are able to claim their truth in ways that for, for decades, wasn't a possibility for folks. So there's there there aren't more trans and non-binary people than there were before. There's just more people able to name their truth. There's more visibility. Mm -hmm. So what you can do to try to counter those talking points is to actually there's and there's resources that we can actually add mm -hmm. now that we've been through this, we can add some more resources to that um that resource page that got sent out um that is specifically about countering anti-trans talking points. And that's a beautiful thing to do is to just familiarize yourself with the anti-trans talking points that are really rampant right now and practice saying, you know, the antidotes to those which exist and we can give you those talking points. But thank you so much for asking that question because that is such an important thing to be grappling with right now. Right. And, you know, again, like just because we don't notice something doesn't mean it wasn't it isn't here. Right. Like that's an important thing that people need to hold on to. Again, I transitioned in my 30s. I, you know, I'm 55 years old when I was growing up that I had the choice to become a nurse or a teacher. That was it. Right. And now all of a sudden, like women are like, right, doctors, women are. It didn't mean that they didn't exist. They just there was no way for that pathway. Right. Like that, that as pathways open, people can step into their fullness. Right more publicly, right? There's a lot of ways that that 
that we've always been here. And he's writing an entire um, anthology of LGBTQ UUs. Don't tell them that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Ignore that. I didn't say anything. But, I mean, I, it's not a secret. It's just that it's a really big project and I'm overwhelmed. I don't want anyone to know that. But he's going, I mean, going back, you know, going back like, you know, 100, 150 years, right? Like, and finding people where, you know, I, the language was different, right? Because if, if you don't have the words, they're, they're different words. People understood themselves to be differently. They're not using the same language. Doesn't mean that if folks could communicate across 100 mm -hmm, years, mm -hmm. that they wouldn't recognize themselves in one another. My grandmother was probably just like me, but she didn't have the ability to live her life in a different way from me, right? Like there's so many, there's so many ways in which that's true. Yeah, but being able to, to just constantly question, where does this story come from and what is actually true is a huge, huge thing that you can do to help. You think we have time for two, two questions done rapid fire? Can we do that? Um, Yes. I mean, there's a few more in there and we might need to, to do a little extend a play <laughs> if there's some people who need the answers to those questions. But um, I wanted to ask, can you please address the intersection of race, culture, trans, two-spirit experience in UU churches? In 30 seconds, go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can talk about the data. Certainly. Actually, yeah, this is um, this is a good point time for me to bring back that data. So this is on the resource list already, but there was a report that was put together by Trust, which is the organization of trans UU religious professionals um, in 2019. And it was based on a survey of hundreds and hundreds of trans UUs. And what Trust found was when we asked the question, you know, how include how inclusive does your UU congregation feel to you as a trans person? Um, what happened was, first of all, the numbers are really sad and depressing, right? So only 28% of the folks who responded said that their UU congregation felt completely inclusive of them as a trans person, only 28%. And, but what happened was when you started to break it down in terms of the other identities that people hold, whether they're a person of color, whether they're disabled, whether they're financially vulnerable, what gender they are, whether they're a trans man, trans woman, non-binary, there was a big difference in terms of people's experiences of inclusion. So one of the most incredible things that we found was just how that broke down. And for example, folks who are uh, folks of color, only 15% of trans people of color felt fully included in their congregations, right? Which is much lower. Um, for, for, for financial stability, that was one of the biggest find, findings that we found that the most financially secure trans folk, 46% of them felt fully included, but the least secure financially trans folk, 11% of them felt fully included, right? And in terms of age, it was also hugely different, right? So people who are under the age of 18, 38% actually doing better than average. But then when you're 19 to 35, 16%, you know, in terms of how included they felt. Folks who are 61 plus, 76% felt fully included in their congregation. So what this says is we have to attend to all of the different identities that folks hold and the ways in which that impacts our experience in congregations. And particularly when we start talking about two-spirit identity and different cultural experiences of gender that can't be translated into something as simple as trans or gay or non-binary, we need to practice extra attentiveness and curiosity and allow people to bring those nuances forward. And again, help help us understand as a, as a, as a movement, what does two-spirit Unitarian Universalism look like? How can we honor that and, and make space for that in our congregations? What does Black trans Unitarian Universalism look like? Because it looks different, right, from probably the average culture of the UU congregation that, um, that we see today. So that's what I would say about that. It's my, as rapid fire as I could possibly be. <laughs> right. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> this is so rich. I don't want to stop, but we'll have one last question. Okay. Um, what has helped you hang in there in this UU world that hasn't caught up yet? Mm. 
I was hoping it would be one for you because I've been talking a lot, but I'm... he's not hanging in. He's like hanging off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. He's adjacent. Uh, Teo isn't actually a Unitarian Universalist, so, mm -hmm. but, um, but I am. And what, what keeps me hopeful and what keeps me here is that I refuse to cede my faith, the faith of my, my race of upbringing. I wasn't born here, but I was raised here. And I know what Unitarian Universalism can be. I experienced unconditional love as a teenager in UU spaces mm -hmm. that saved my life, right? Mm -hmm. And I want that for everyone. I want that for all of you. I know that our, our movement is a caterpillar that can become a butterfly um, and that we have everything that we need to actually transform already within us. This faith is gorgeous. It has the best theology. Okay, I'm not trying to be all hierarchical oh. about it. It has a great theology, <laughs> but we have a lot of work to do. Um, but that's what keeps me here is that I, I know what's possible for us. I have the imagination to know where we can go. And I want to be a part of that. I want to see that come to pass. I want mm -hmm. a future for us as a faith, for all of us, as you use, um, that lives into our potential. Hmm. Wow. When you speak like that, so maybe if you don't know this, but in the, the chat, there's been quite some conversation and I'll just read it a few things because it kind of connects. Is there any real reason to have hope that our brick and mortar congregations will ever culturally appropriate from, appropriate from the youth and young adults, question mark? Or are we destined to only have online community once we age out? Mm. Someone later down there saying, you know, can we not raise the age to 50? Um, folks, this is one of the biggest issues of inclusion. We are going to be talking about ageism next time, but basically what you are seeing is what Alex was saying. It's that youth and young adults have already created, co-created a culture that is far more inclusive than the uh, older adult population has created. Mm -hmm. And it's causing a drop off. We need to shift. It's, it's of, of vital importance. Alex is stating, you know, in, you know, in, in his experience, it's been, you know, life-changing, life-saving, right? So as we close up this forum, right, where we're not just talking about um, gender here, but we are, we're talking about age. We're talking about, you know, the accepting and creating space for the whole of our communities to be. Wow. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I mean, we, we knew that the topic was big, but as you talk about it more, I think that it becomes more clear just how linked the topic of gender inclusion is to the growth and welfare and longevity of this movement and relevance, relevance in, we're in Canada, but also, you know, the US where you are. So. Yeah. I, you know, I believe deeply that there is always hope when we are still capable of getting into our hearts and when we are still capable of seeing the people across from us to see their humanity. And that is something that we can lose and recover and lose and recover. And as long as that is still true, then there's always hope, right? Even, you know, if, if Black trans folks, you know, that in my community of, of people living with HIV, right? If those folks can keep showing up every day, right? Like, it's possible, right? And, and and again, like someone like me, like I've been living with HIV nearly half my life, right? Like every single time we can get back into our hearts and back into our bodies, right? And look around and feel connected to the world around us. There's no reason not to hope, right? It's just that hope can't be where it lives. It has to actually, there has to be an action that goes with that. Yes. Mm. Wonderful way to wrap up. Well, I guess it's like my turn to just thank all of the ambassadors of hope that uh, have made this inclusivity forum come to life. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can live out this hope in the world when we leave. So I wanna thank the uh, trailblazers sharing your stories. Thank you for your vulnerability, for sharing in the videos our facilitators who just do such a fantastic job mm -hmm. at keeping us soft and feathery in our hearts. Mm 
and especially you know to Alex and Teo thank you so much for just opening us up and bringing us on a journey that uh, I feel so excited about and not just uh, in terms of gender inclusion but just um, culturally as a whole I just feel really energized right now so thank you so much for that and uh, to remind everyone that we do have another inclusivity forum coming November 5th and that the silo of that, not that we want to silo, is, uh, is on ageism. So um, that's going to wrap up the five inclusivity forums that we've put together so that afterward we can move into our inclusivity action groups and climate action groups where we get to come together with folks of like experience or a desire to take action with those with those people and um and see what what happens Erin anything else I was just going to say that if there's a desire um to stay for a few minutes after because your question was asked and you didn't have a chance to, to answer it I was going to ask Alex and Tay are you okay to mm -hmm. you know, 10 minutes or something like that Okay, and then our, our facilitators, you'll stay after um, for a debrief, please. Shauna. Thank you. Come back, Shauna. <laughs> we would love to hear from you. I never went anywhere, but I'm, I'm not spotlighted. So I guess I'm not in Zoom. That means you're not actually, you don't actually exist unless you're spotlighted. There you go. Um, <laughs> What a, what a task for me to try to offer some closing words to this. Um, I actually feel like part of the closing that I'm feeling in my body is a, a closing that reminds us of our ancestors, that we were not the first, as Alice Walker said, who to have, have loved and lost and, and died. Um, I'm thinking of Audre Lorde right in this moment for some reason is the ancestor that is popping into my heart um, because she said we were never meant to survive. Um, and many of us have felt that way at different times in our lives. And yet if it weren't for the Audre Lords, we wouldn't be here. And so for all of us, whether we have those ancestors in our own family line or in the line of the great cloud of witnesses, I just want us to give thanks for those people uh, who, who blazed a trail for all of us um, to, to be here continuing their work to stand on their shoulders. And then I also wanna, and I, and I wanna think about the UU folks who did that. I think about Egbert Ethelred Brown and I think about Viola Liuzzo and I think about all of the people in our UU history, the heroes and the sheroes and the two spirit folks who, who kept saying, there should be room for me at this table. Make more room for me, love me. And so we wanna honor them too uh, with their legacy. And then I want us to think about all the young people that we have met, who we have loved and who have loved us. Uh, like Alex, I grew up in this faith. And so I think about the, the youth that I was in youth group with who, who come into my heart regularly. I wanna think about the songs that I sang, the fires that I was gathered around and the elders, the mentors, the people who were with me along the way, as well as my peers. And for all of us, we have those people who are the toddlers in our community beckoning us forward. Who are the people asking us to love more, to love bigger, to love bolder, to love broader, than we ever thought possible because that is the hope. It's not in a hymnal, it's not in a building, it's not in a static anything. It's in the way that our loves and our neural pathways as we were reminded tonight can expand. So let's take a new path together. Let's make a new path together. Let's love bigger together because we can. Of course we can. You can always love more and more person, right? Every day you can love one more person. So let's do that. Let's do that. Amen. And blessed be.